Next up, we have Mandy Gibson. Mandy is from the Australian Institute for Suicide Research and Prevention at Griffith University in Queensland. And today we'll be speaking to research around linking First Nations suicide mortality rates with community cultural connectedness data. Over to you, Mandy. Thanks very much. Just checking the screens all working. Yep. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'd also like to acknowledge I am presenting on uh, Yagara Jarana, the country of the Yagara people. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge the enduring connection on the land we're meeting on in various parts of the country and overseas today. I'd also like to acknowledge the harms caused by actions of historic and continued colonization, which have sought to diminish that connection, the impacts of which are seen in the disproportionate burden of suicide borne by First Nations communities today, and in many of the other areas we're seeing First Nations young people overrepresented in adverse outcomes. I'm sure many people listening today are very well aware of the poor outcomes experienced today across the many issues that people are presenting with regards to of particular concern with suicide is that the gap between First Nations and non-Indigenous suicide rates increases the younger the age cohort under examination is. So while overall the age standardised total population rate is a bit over twice as high for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, for young people under 15, that rate increases to almost eight times as high for the non-Indigenous peers which means that one in three young people who died by suicide in our state last year, of youth suicides in our state last year, were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people. So reducing Indigenous youth suicide mortality is critical to reducing our total and national and state youth suicide mortality rates. And of course, having meaningful closure in the life expectancy gaps for First Peoples in Australia. Also, we know that while suicide rates are increasing in all age groups, this continues with young people in Queensland and in Australia, which is really noticeable when many of the other causes of childhood death were actually able to see decreases. So reducing suicide is critically important to actually reducing our overall paediatric mortality rates. So even though we have known about this for decades, we have seen very little evidence that the First Nations youth suicide rate is actually meaningfully reducing, or even the gap with non-Indigenous peers is even reducing. Suicide remains the leading cause of death for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people aged between five and 17 across this nation. So while we've known about this, these disparities for decades and decades, there's actually very limited evidence of effective suicide prevention models for First Nations communities. We recently conducted a systematic review of all First Peoples suicide prevention programs globally. And in that process, we found only three that examined and found improved outcomes in suicide related indicators for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people. And then one additional one that looked at adults in Australia. So there's obviously many reasons for this mismatch between how severe and how complex we know this problem is and how long we've known about it and how little data we've, um, a, a little evidence of meaningful change we've actually been able to produce in that time. But one of the key reasons that is increasingly a focus in suicide prevention is the fact that there's a significant mismatch between the data we use to understand and in turn try and prevent First Nations youth suicide as it is very much built on the data and experiences of non-Indigenous young people. For example, here in Queensland, looking at the data of people who have died by suicide, we know that First Nations young people, compared to their non-Indigenous peers, were less likely to have ever experienced symptoms of mental illness, less likely to have ever communicated intent, and in some studies, even less likely to have had a recent suicide attempt. As these are both the key indicators and data we often look for in our analyses, and from a clinical point of view, they're also the key indicators we use in screening and triaging to determine which young people get help. So it's not surprising that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people who have died by suicide were less likely to have ever received any mental health treatment or psychosocial support compared to their non-Indigenous peers. So data like this is being increasingly used to acknowledge that we need to, I guess, move on from the traditional strategies that seek to just pick out which young people need support and treatment 
and move to models that also include protective effects and preventative mechanisms operating at the whole of community level. But predominantly, this data shows us that regardless of which level of intervention or where we're targeting our programs, it is really critical that we expand from the traditional forms of data we are using to understand and indeed prevent Indigenous suicide, that we need First Nations specific data and models to intervene. Because we already know that many key factors and key risk factors for suicidality are either excluded or at least fail to be centered within many traditional models of suicide prevention and triage. Most notably here, of course, are the experiences of discrimination and racism. We already have a lot of research that finds that this uh, experiences of racism and discrimination are associated with greater suicidal ideation, attempts, and various other indicators of suicidal thoughts and behaviors for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people of all ages in Australia. With some studies actually finding the relationship between racism and discrimination to actually be stronger and have greater influence on suicidal thoughts and behaviors than many of our very traditional risk factors, such as uh, health issues or um, income related issues or drug and alcohol related issues. And even some studies finding the gender differential, having less um, uh, male rates not being much higher for First Nations young people compared to the influence of racism and discrimination. So with such strong effects and notable effects of these culturally specific risk factors on suicide, we want to build on these findings to examine other culturally specific data and critically to look at preventative and protective factors that can underpin our interventions to reduce these rates. And I guess putting the academic data and literature aside and the reasons for doing this from that point of view, just going back to our initial acknowledgement of country, in suicide prevention research, it is broadly accepted and fairly widely stated that, that the suicide rates experienced today are the result of colonial actions of community dispossession and cultural dislocation, that these are in fact causal. Yet as researchers, we haven't commensurately actually applied that logically we should be looking at community empowerment and cultural connectedness to alleviate these effects. These have actually been quite limited in our focus and in our um, intervention and evaluation designs, in fact. And that is very much the focus of this particular research project I'm presenting some of today. Broadly to examine the relationships between data on cultural connection with suicide modality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people. Of course, there are many challenges trying to access cultural data, particularly at the community level as is needed for looking at suicide mortality. Of course, there are challenges with identifying individuals, especially in small areas and remote locations. So our friends at the National Centre for Social and Economic Modelling have used aggregated survey responses from the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Survey. Um, I'm sure many people are aware of this survey, um, with the many epidemiologists here. But this survey is conducted every six years, completed by First Nations residents, 15 years and older. And it looks at general health and well-being and uh, social support but it also looks at cultural activities and cultural expression and engagement and how individuals are applying that in their lives. So um, uh, friends from NATSM have then used those aggregated survey responses and benchmarked them and validated them against census data, so, uh, uh, indicators such as household size and age in order to gain uh, reliable small area estimates of social and cultural indicators which are then reweighted <laughs> for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations at the SA2 level, so the statistical area level two, so the second smallest of the ASGS. And they've been able to do that in a way that doesn't identify individuals. I won't further explain this methodology, but the link is there. Um, please contact me if you want to uh, talk about how to use that in your own studies or different analyses, love to have a yarn. So for this study, with comparing Indigenous youth suicide mortality rates by the percentage of Indigenous language speakers in each SA2. And we're looking at, at cultural aspects of social capital. So a multi-item index that looks at attending ceremonies, um, Indigenous specific organizations and activities, as well as general social capital to uh, perceived ability to give and receive support within their local area. And we're also looking at discrimination, comparing suicide rates where more than 25% of the First Nations residents report they experienced racial discrimination in the previous year. 
And here in Queensland, the main mortality database we're using to look at, uh, calculate uh, age and anti suicide rates for First Nations young people is the Queensland Suicide Register. I believe it's actually the longest running suicide registry in the world. We have um, cases and information on all suspected suicides going back to 1993 in Queensland. And in this process, we collect information from a number of uh, sources from police and from coroners and a number of other places in order to collect up to 400 different variables relating to the evidence of um, probability of suicidality and the literature and keeping that up to date with what we know about suicide and uh, predictive variables. So we use that to in a flowchart to classify the probability of suicide into beyond reasonable doubt, probable, possible or unlikely. I'm just using the first two, beyond reasonable doubt and probable for this particular study. And we have additional uh, cross checking for First Nations identification at the registry of births and deaths and marriages. So with the QSR database, we're able to then code and calculate age standardized suicide rates at the SA2 level for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people. And using this data, we're also able to compare suicide rates based on economic resources using the CIFA indices, as well as remoteness, comparing suicide rates in cities, metropolitan areas versus regional and remote. So for those of you that don't have to look at forest plots too often, where the uh, purple pink line is, that shows that um, a rate ratio of one would say that any area where the black error bars exceeds that line, we would say those are statistically significantly different, those two rates. So the suicide rates in the areas of high and low uh, cultural connectedness variables or general community variables. So the first thing noticing here, of course, is that the cultural aspects of social capital, that communities in which First Nations residents had greater involvement with cultural events, activities and attendance at cultural organizations and general ability to give and support each other in their communities, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people died by suicide at a significantly lower rate, which is rather interesting when you can see that socioeconomic resources, that difference was not statistically significant. So the social and cultural resources have influenced youth suicide in a way that social and economic resources such as income and education have not but of course, the most striking thing here is looking at the influence of discrimination. So communities where more of where more than 25% of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population reported experiencing racial discrimination in the previous 12 months, First Nations young people ended their lives at a rate more than two and a half times as high as communities where fewer people experienced discrimination. So while these findings are fairly stark and provide somewhat promising evidence that Indigenous specific data can provide important information to help guide both our understanding and our prevention of First Nations suicide, it is important to acknowledge that our variables, particularly the uh, cultural social capital variable, may have some underlying correlations with other protective uh, factors or other general community level risk factors. For example, um, a greater propensity to engage in Indigenous specific services may reflect more services to engage with or um, greater support to share with community and greater sense of capacity to share may just reflect that may just reflect that there are more resources to share. So for our next study using in these analyses we wanted to compare the high and low levels of these culturally specific protective factors in the communities with the most social and environmental disadvantage. So those with the least social and economic resources, so income, education, overcrowding, um, job type, regional and remote services, uh, communities with the least services and the furthest distance to access healthcare and shops and various other supports. And the communities where the most Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander residents reported experiencing discrimination. I'll leave this slide here for a bit, I realize there's a lot going on. But firstly, interesting here that while we saw on the previous slide, there was very little difference in communities with high and low levels of Indigenous language use, in all of the three communities with the greatest social and environmental disadvantage, fewer uh, young people ended their lives by suicide in communities where there was higher language use, suggesting that 
maybe some culturally specific protective factors actually have the greatest influence where there is most disadvantage and provide the most support for young people to buffer against the, I guess, social and environmental legacies of colonization through this area level disadvantage. But what, oh, sorry, what strikes me here is looking at the effects on discrimination that both the Indigenous language use and the cultural aspects of social capital had the greatest influence on the rates at which Indigenous young people took their lives in the communities where there was the most discrimination, where more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people reported recent discrimination, suggesting that the adverse effects of discrimination may be particularly amenable to change through cultural interventions or that there is a meaningful buffering occurring against the multiple indicators that we see disadvantage um, continuing for First Nations people in this country, that providing cultural protective factors may have a unique buffering effect on suicide, as well as many other areas that we see significantly poorer outcomes as a result of disadvantage and discrimination. So I realize I'm just um, going into the break time, so I will wrap up fairly quickly. Um, Acknowledging that, of course, these are very initial and preliminary findings. But nonetheless, this really does, using this novel form of data that is not what we classically look like as look at as suicide prevention researchers, but nonetheless, this opens up very new avenues for understanding and addressing Indigenous suicide mortality disparities, whether that's through society-wide efforts to reduce discrimination as a serious public health concern, or whether we look at Indigenous language rejuvenation and supporting cultural um, community expression programs. But this provides really important information, particularly when for First Nations young people, we have very little evidence of effective programs to reduce these disparities. And we have no evidence that we have meaningfully made changes in um, two to three decades that we've known about this challenge. So while I, I wanna acknowledge most importantly, that while it's very easy to say this is new findings or this is novel research, it's we're a bit guilty, I know, as researchers of not sitting to acknowledge that this is in no way new knowledge on these lands, that the importance of using a cultural connection to buffer the harms of colonization has been promoted for decades and decades and decades. And the importance of connecting to culture to know who you are and imagine a positive future for yourself and see indigeneity as a positive thing in the uh, 22nd and 23rd centuries and the positive effect of young people that has been known on these lands for millennia. So uh, thank you very much. I'll um, uh, hand back over. I believe we're going to um, uh, morning tea now and I think um, question time is after the break I believe. So thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation and, and thank you again for your important research in this space. Um, we can have, we still got a long way to go to reducing the suicide rates, particularly in our indigenous young people. Okay, um, so please keep your Q and A's um, coming through the Q and A section at the bottom of the bar. Um, look, we are gonna take a short break. We are gonna pinch a little bit of time. So rather than start at 11.25, we will actually start at 11.30. Um, so a quick 10 minute break and, and we'll be back with our um, future presentations. Thank you. <laughs>